Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Welcome. Today we have Matt Hunkler, who's the founder and CEO of Powderkeg. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Good to be back in developer town. Glad to have you. So, all right, this powder keg thing, tell us what it is and what you guys do. Sure. So we talk about powder keg as a community as a service platform. What that means is uh, we're really providing the same sorts of resources and tools that some of the best startup communities and startup ecosystems out there currently provide. So you think of like a Silicon Valley, you think of New York, it has all of these resources in just a small geography of land, right? We talk about that as like a density of resources capital, talent, customers, all those areas have all of that in spades, all in one small area. Here in Indianapolis, we're never gonna have that. In some of the other markets that we serve, like Raleigh, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, we're just never going to surpass Silicon Valley in terms of that sheer amount of resources. But that doesn't mean we can't compile and organize those resources on a digital platform. So we talk about a powder keg as a digital density. Uh, so that's what we're doing. We're helping entrepreneurs connect to the resources they need, whether it's talent, capital, or customers, so they can grow and scale faster from wherever they live. Awesome. Talk a little bit about the journey of how powder keg came about. Oh man, I will say that powder keg is the first business I ever started that was not initially meant to be a business. Um, so I started Powder Keg after moving to Indianapolis. I had just sold my first company that I started in college. Uh, it was a little consultancy doing uh, small business, you know, websites, software development, light software development, um, some digital marketing. And I uh, was fortunate enough to sell that before I graduated, you know, not for Zuckerberg money or anything, but enough to pay off the student loans and invest in the next one. That next one that I started, um, I, I started literally two months after I sold my first business, after telling myself I would take two years off to go work for someone else and just right. just learn and be a sponge. Uh, that lasted about two months. Um, started a company on the side, nights and weekends, uh, while I was working at a high growth tech company called Blue Lock, which just sold here uh, in Indianapolis. I'm giving you the long-winded version, Mike, so uh, bear with me here. But I started that business, um, it was called Repurify. It was an e-commerce platform for non-toxic products and cosmetics. Um, and so lesson learned, I was about four years too early or undercapitalized, depending on how you wanna look at it. And I didn't know it at the time. I, I didn't have the mentorship I needed. I didn't have the capital that I would have needed to last another four years to hit it, like all the companies that did hit it when yeah. that market finally caught on in like 2013, 2014, five years after I started my business. And it was a really painful process. It was a painful, two plus years uh, working on that product. And out of that frustration, that was sort of like me grasping towards friends or mentors to come together. And that sort of like loose knit group of entrepreneurial friends that I formed back in 2009, 2010 is sort of what formed the foundation of what is now Powder Keg. And so it really was like four or five years of learning how to help these entrepreneurs. Repurify didn't work out, uh, spoiler alert. But, but it, was, uh, it was successful in the sense that it really helped me understand the pain points of a high growth, high scale tech entrepreneur. Uh, meanwhile, I'm in a sales and marketing role at a high growth technology company. So seeing it from that perspective as well, and then just hearing it from my friends at the time, you know, the, the entrepreneurs here uh, in Indianapolis and the mentors uh, that I still look up to today, yourself included. And Michael Cloran, um, one of the other partners here at, at Developer Town was one of the he was at one of the first meetings we ever had uh, up at a bar in a back room of a broader pool bar here in Indianapolis. You know, it was really over the last, it was over those first like four or five years that I gained some of the insights that has led us to building the technology platform that really we just started building last summer and changing the trajectory of this organization as a whole. Help somebody who may not be familiar with Powder Keg, help place them kind of where you are today. So how many... And so powder keg is a lot of things, maybe start with the digital platform. So how many people are on the platform? How would you classify those people in terms of the types of users that they are? Have you, if you could talk about revenue, that'd be great. If you want to talk about how much money you guys have raised, that'd be great. Maybe just paint a picture for somebody who might not be familiar with where you guys are, kind of what stage of the journey you're in. 
Sure. I'll probably overshare. I'm a big believer in transparency. I think it's a really good thing for entrepreneurs to embody. Um, I've seen it and it's not like this is my thing, transparency. It's just I've learned it from seeing other entrepreneurs. The, the, the entrepreneurs that are willing to be open about what they're working on, um, to ask for help when they need help, uh, which I certainly do a lot and you've been there multiple times along the journey, they're the ones that ultimately succeed. You know, Being humble enough to say, hey, this is where I am. What do I do next? So I, I'm happy to share. From a user standpoint, we have over 10,000 members within the Powder Cake community. Now, those are people who have attended some of the events that we've hosted and continue to engage on the platform, whether that's our emails that they open and engage with, whether it's actually active on this software platform that we've built um, specifically for those high growth tech entrepreneurs, um, or it's even engaging through some of our social channels and things like that. Now, in terms of our paid users, we, we just launched this platform, took it to market in October, very soft, soft beta, uh, kind of under, under the radar, um, invite only platform. We opened it up, invited about 50, 60 entrepreneurs here in Indianapolis onto the platform. Um, and this is the actual software platform. Uh, and we had about 30 of them sign on board. Since then, we've had organic growth, you know, another dozen or so members onto the platform. Um, so what we're doing right now in terms of revenue numbers, we have some huge partners that are on the platform. These are sort of our corporate memberships. So these are the sales forces of the world, the rise of the rests, the Kauffman Foundation, et cetera. Um, so in, in corporate memberships, we're doing north of 35,000 uh, in monthly MRR. Uh, in terms of our premium membership, those are the high growth tech entrepreneurs. They're doing about 3,500, just north of 3,500 in MRR. So what that looks like for us is a huge growth opportunity as we continue to scale into more markets. Um, in fact, we just announced today our partnership with Centrifuge in Cincinnati, um, and they've been immensely helpful with making those introductions to the entrepreneurs and the organizations down there uh, as we really kind of ignite that market. So our goal is really to be in 50 cities uh, by 2020. So getting the top 50 tech entrepreneurs or 50 of the top. We don't not want to necessarily like rank the entrepreneurs because you really can't do that. Uh, but oh, I can. Oh, you can. And I do. You can. <laughs> um, well, and maybe maybe if we can ask you to do that <laughs> uh, as, as one of our investors, Mike, we would love to have you uh, on the platform uh, grading everybody and ranking them. I'm not sure if they would like that. Oh, that would end perfectly. Yeah, the top, yeah. The top one or two will appreciate it. <laughs> the other 48, not so much. Um, so yeah, our goal is 50-50 by 2020. 50 of the top tech entrepreneurs in each of 50 markets by 2020. And for us, that's gonna take a lot of fuel in the tank to make that happen. So we're raising a small round right now. We have a good portion of it, um, the majority of it actually already committed um, with friends like Developer Town uh, in the mix, which we are super excited about. You guys were the first check-in. Thank you. Uh, which is really freaking awesome. Uh, really very much appreciated, but we also have you know, seasoned entrepreneurs and executives like uh, former CEO of Salesforce Marketing Cloud, Scott McCorkle, uh, is in, involved in the round. We have uh, some of the other technologists and entrepreneurs like John Qualls, who is my first mentor when I moved to Indianapolis, uh, founder awesome. of Blue Lock. Um, so it's just, it's really exciting. Uh, and it's great to have an official, I've always had like these amazing advisors in my life, but kind of have official, official relationship so that they can share the success as Powder Keg continues to grow. Very cool. All right, so let's talk about competition real quick. So tell me a little bit, when you th look at the market and you think about who you're competing with within the Powder Keg digital platform, what does that look like for you? Because it's kind of non-traditional in, in that you have the community, right? So you have the events and, and the, the broader Powder Keg community, and then you have the digital platform itself. So when, when you think of, like when you look out at the market and say, okay, these are, whether it's time and attention from the entrepreneurs, whether it's, it's dollars, like whatever resource you're trying to get from that audience, who else is trying to get that same resource and how do you think of competition? So who else is trying to get that same resource? Any entrepreneur that, that is working on something that's high growth uh, and scalable in the technology field. Um, you know, our sweet spot is sort of serving the entrepreneurs that at that like million dollars in ARR or a million dollars in outside funding up to about series C. Uh, we have some that are a little bit further advanced than that. We have some that are maybe a little earlier stage, you know, 500K of ARR, but 
kind of the core of the platform uh, really serves that entrepreneur that's maybe raised a little bit of a seed round, but they need help connecting to some of those Series A funders or Series B funders. Um, they need connections to the talent that they're going to need, uh, whether that's some of the director level talent or all the SDRs, all of the, everything else you need to build a high growth venture. So in terms of competition, that's the kind of the exciting thing about this business right now is um, we really see this as a almost a category that we're creating. That's why I use the phrase community as a service in describing what we're doing. There are some organizations that do kind of community as a service, but not quite focus on the specific target demographic. You know, really the market insight that we have is that these entrepreneurs that aren't in New York and that aren't in Silicon Valley are very similar. You know, if you're not in New York, if you're not in Silicon Valley, just about everywhere else, it's a pretty similar problem. The lack of access to these resources. And so the beauty of that creating a category is that it allows us to define where we play in that category. And so by being sort of a thought leader in creating that category, it gives us a huge competitive advantage. We do know that there are other organizations that obviously serve entrepreneurs uh, that are out there. We look at them as more like coopetition, uh, if that makes sense. So uh, we're partnered with those organizations, right? Rise of the Rest is a great example. Steve Case and their team are out writing $100,000 checks uh, in five cities in a single tour, right? And we're partnered with them as their official pitch partner on this next tour. We're going to be in like Birmingham, Alabama, Memphis, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Dallas, Texas, and Louisville, where Steve's writing a check. I'm definitely not writing any checks, but I'll be helping prepare these entrepreneurs to put their best foot forward um, in front of the Rise of the Rest team, the judging team, um, because Steve and their team is going to write up a big novelty check. Um, I'm not sure if they actually make them cash that novelty check or if they give them a real size check. These are the Happy Gilmore size checks. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Right the ha- exactly. The Happy Gilmore. But yes, you're thinking correctly if you're thinking the Happy Gilmore size check. And so we partner with them because the idea is, you know, Rise of the Rest is going to come in with the funding. We can come in and help these entrepreneurs now that they have that funding and they're probably closing around around that funding. Uh, how do we help them now hire that talent, now find those bigger customers? network beyond their local geography. So beyond Birmingham, beyond Dallas, Texas, how can we connect these entrepreneurs with more national set of resources um, and even globally in some cases? So in that sense, we look to collaborate more than compete. Uh, but some of the other organizations that are playing, and I, I know that you want to like actually hear like what are some of the other companies that are playing in this space. Um, so some of the other companies that We've been inspired by, uh, frankly, uh, YEC, started by a couple of, of my friends. I'm a member of YEC, the Young Entrepreneurs Council, um, which is a national, I think maybe global organization uh, of young entrepreneurs. And it's not specifically tech or venture driven companies. Um, so in that sense, it gives you a little bit more diversity, which can be nice. From that same point of networking with, with other folks, you know, sometimes it's nice to meet an agency owner or it's nice to meet someone who's running an e-commerce company. That's, that's not kind of like a high growth e-commerce business. In that sense, it's really good networking. It's diverse networking, but it's not very focused around, you know, my needs as a high growth SaaS entrepreneur or software as a service entrepreneur. So I, I think in that sense, it's very uh, collaborative or value add, right? So I will continue to be a member of YEC. I also continue to be a member of my own platform at Powder Keg, right? So, uh, and, and likewise, I've encouraged some of my friends that are already YEC members to become Powder Keg members. And I've in, encouraged some of our clients, um, our customers who are on the platform, you know, hey, you might want to check out YEC. They do some of these cool things at some of these bigger conferences like South by Southwest. I, I think what Ryan and, and um, uh, Scott Gerber are doing there is, is awesome. Uh, similarly, there are other organizations out there, obviously, that serve entrepreneurs, uh, but there are also uh, other professional network tools, right? LinkedIn being a big one. Uh, AngelList being a big one. There are some aspects of those platforms um, that we have uh, built into our platform or on the roadmap for our platform, but that those tools aren't currently solving. So it's it's really all about how do you find the thing that people are still complaining about? Like, man, I wish LinkedIn would just do this, or man, I wish, you know, AngelList is great, but I wish it did this one thing, uh, or I wish it had this one thing. Those are the things we're building into the platform when, you know, preponderance of entrepreneurs are uh, kind of voicing that opinion. But in a lot of ways too, we're building things that maybe the customers aren't asking for directly, but when we show it to them, they're like, oh man, I didn't know I needed that, but I absolutely needed that in my life. 
just a couple of things I picked out of there. One is you used the phrase platforms that you've pulled inspiration from. And then in the very end there, you're talking a little bit about customer development. So that's one of the interesting things that I like to dig into, which is when you think of your product roadmap and where those ideas come from, whether it's, you know, in, inspired by another product in the market, pain that you're hearing, it's an unmet need in the market, like you said, with LinkedIn and AngelList or somebody on the team having a vision for where the product is going and saying kind of the last thing you said, right? Like when we show this to, to, to users, they're like, yeah, I didn't even know I needed this, but thank you. Right. Like this, this is great. How do you, how do you guys as a team balance between those? Like when you guys set the product roadmap or when you figure out what you're going to work on next, how much of that is market driven? Like you're looking at, at, at what else is going on and saying, okay, we, sh- we should probably do that too versus no, this is going to be the thing that's going to drive the most value. And so let's do that. How do you guys as a team make that decision? That's a good question. And we're s- still working on that as we're growing the team now. Uh, now that we've taken on some funding, we're building the team every day. I think I have three interviews today that I've got to get to this afternoon, uh, which is always exciting. But the way where you think about it now, well, first let me talk about how we thought about it when we started building this platform. Uh, because one of my practices that I have as an entrepreneur in previous roles and working for other companies is as I hear customers uh, complain about things, maybe that aren't even related to my business, my current business or my product, but are related to the industry as a whole. Uh, I always try to like write them down. Like you see me right now with my notebook in front of me. Um, this notebook is full of, full of ideas. Now they're not all great ideas, uh, but they're full of ideas. Uh, and I, I really believe in like just capturing that somewhere. A lot of times I don't even look back on it again, but if it was really a great idea, I will remember it and it will come back and it will come back and it will come back. And sometimes that comes from a customer complaint, but a lot of times that comes from, you know, someone's uh, talking about this other thing and you're like, you know what, that's related to uh, this adjacent industry. And I saw this other business solve this issue in a really interesting way for that industry. I wonder if I built that over here, if the, if the customer would really benefit from that specific product or feature. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I really first when I'm when I'm thinking about a product, I try to think like what's different, not just better, right? Like a bad business plan, a bad product plan is I'm gonna make LinkedIn but better, right? Like that that is a terrible product proposition. The, the a good product proposition is I am going to build something different than LinkedIn because LinkedIn currently isn't solving these pain points, and they're not even going to be thinking about solving those pain points because if they are thinking about solving those pain points, probably they're going to crush your startup, right? Right. But if I can differentiate and give something to customers that is truly different, one, that will be something that is remarkable as long as you did a good job designing and developing the product, uh, which means like it is worthy of being remarked upon telling other customers um, and two, it gives you the opportunity to uh, find yourself in a situation where you don't really have a lot of direct competition, which can give you a really great head start when kind of building that initial customer base. And that's sort of like the mode that we're in right now. So we came to the market with something that is different. And then now we're getting feedback on those um, features and, and uh, benefits that we've built into that product and into that platform. So now it's a cycle of better. How do we make those features that were differentiated better? And so I, I kind of think about it in those ways. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not like capturing all of this insight for more differentiated features down the road. But if I could just continue to add different feature after different feature after different value prop after different value prop, you would just get this big bloated platform or product that customers may or may not love, probably not because it would probably be very confusing right? <laughs> and, and like it'd be hard to engage with it. And you would miss the opportunity to fine tune and really find like out of these five features in the initial MVP or minimum viable product, you know, these two are really resonating. Let's make those two really great and let's downplay these other or even completely cut the three that people are like, eh, it's okay. Take it or leave it. We're not really engaging with it, but it doesn't hurt to leave it in there. Um, you miss the opportunity to, you know, take a product that simply has product market fit and make it a truly great product. Yeah. Earlier, you mentioned that 
you like to think of yourself as defining the category, right? One of the things that occurs to me in that is that it, the second you get success or even are perceived to have success, whether it's real or not, I would imagine you're going to start to see quick followers in the market. Yep. who are going to try to chase that success. Have, have you started to see that since you've gotten a little bit more vocal about the platform and what you guys are trying to do and or in any of the specific markets that you guys have a larger presence in? Have you noticed uh, other people trying to, to kind of jump on that bandwagon? Or is that is it still, do you think, a little too early for that? I think it might be um, a little early for that to be kind of like the, hey, everyone's me too, uh, you know, doing this as well. I also don't think that that um, category has been fully defined yet. We're actually doing um, some work right now around that kind of defining, um, defining uh, in, in a more succinct way the real pain point here and defining that category. Um, and we're working with partners to do that, right? Like we're working with Rise of the Rest. We're working with, uh, you know, our partners down in Kansas City at the Kauffman Foundation. Our category is one of those ones where we, we want people to follow us into this because the pain point is so huge, right? Like there is so much more efficiency to be gained in the entrepreneurial, uh, the sort of like startup life cycle that like we want to encourage that. We want to create this category with people um, and start to kind of like help and say, hey, we don't do this one specific thing, but here's a way you can you could build that and how that could plug into our platform. So in that sense, we really kind of want to build build out this ecosystem to help the startups as they grow and scale. As you think of um, the product maturing over time, have you guys explored possible partnerships or integrations? Not maybe not at the community level, which I, I know you already do a ton of that stuff, but on the technical level, like as you forecast out down the road, or maybe you've already done some of these and I'm just unaware of it, which is totally possible. Uh, do you see a path where you would be partnering with AngelList or partnering, you know, whoever, right? Like, is that on the roadmap? Absolutely. <laughs> Awkward silence. <laughs> Got it. Check. All right. <laughs> Uh, not talking about that. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, then the, so, so maybe a different angle at that same topic. How do you guys think about the right place to partner versus we should just build our own better mousetrap? Can you riff on that for yeah, a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, <laughs> sorry for the vague, uh, absolutely dead silence oh, answer. Beautiful. I love it. Um, we are talking to some really great uh, platforms that we're very excited about the direction that it's headed uh, in terms of partnerships. Um, we're not ready to talk about those yet. Clearly. However, I, c- I can share some of the philosophy, you know, on build versus partner, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I do think this kind of goes back to the like, where are you differentiated? Um, you know, what are those two features that your customers absolutely love? Uh, and then how do you just like go deeper on that, right? Like make it easier, make the UX even better. Um, this is really important, especially when you're talking about having entrepreneurs as customers. How do you make it so that instead of making it easy for an entrepreneur to get an introduction to uh, an investor that just happens proactively as if it's magically, you know, wow, I just got three investors introduced to me and I didn't even have to ask for that, but yeah, I am going to be raising a series A soon. So, um, those are the places where you should build and continue to build. Um, and, and you know, frankly, a lot of our partnership with developer town over the years has helped, you know, shape our thinking around this where it's like, you know, we host events. You mentioned that we host events. And events right now are a great way to get people more engaged with the platform, more engaged with the community, uh, and at the same time, test some of the things that we're building. Um, You know, we could say, hey, we're going to go build a ticketing system because we sometimes host events that are, you know, our sales funnel or that are that are helping, you know, engage people in the community and get them introduced to Powder Keg and our partners. That would be really silly for us to go and build our own ticketing system because there's a bajillion ticketing systems out there. Most people have registered on Eventbrite before in the past, all kinds of other ones from Evite to, I mean, gosh, there's so many, you name it, Meetup, et cetera. Why would we go and build our own ticketing system? We'll never catch up with any of those ticketing systems. And so a lot of times we'll just use things off the shelf until there's enough pain that we're hearing from our customers saying, hey, we love, you know, as a customer, we love using Slack for P 
peer-to-peer communications, you know, connecting the, our customer base on Slack is something that we, we're doing right now and seeing huge benefit. We're not hearing enough of a pain point around that yet to start building our own communication tools into the platform. But I imagine at some point in time, there will be things that entrepreneurs want to do on Slack, unless Slack is developing in that direction, right. that won't allow us to do what we want to do with it. And so maybe at that point, it might make sense for us to build in some communication tools directly into the platform. Got it. want to pivot the conversation a little bit into maybe some some of your lessons learned in the community and, and some of your experience with Powder Keg over the years, but we're kind of running out of time. So would you mind doing a part two with me? I would love to do a part two. All right. So to wrap this one up, why don't you tell people where they can learn more about Powder Keg and maybe find you on the internets? Sure. Uh, I do occasionally use the internets. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, at Hunkler. Um, that's my last name, H-U-N-C-K-L-E-R. Yes, I know there's more consonants than I need, um, but it is H-U-N-C-K-L-E-R. You can find me there. I reply. Would love to have a conversation there. And then you can find Powder Keg at Powder Keg on Instagram uh, and on Facebook. Unfortunately, we're still at Powder Keg Co. on Twitter. Uh, but you can find us at powderkeg.com and it's all linked up there uh, where you can find our podcast, uh, where you can find uh, a lot of resources there for entrepreneurs. That's right. Your podcast is legit. And there uh, there was a lot of talk of uh, startup competitors on the podcast that you were kind enough to invite me on, uh, which I can't remember which podcast number that was. But I should know that off the top of my head, no but way. I don't. There's no chance. But you should definitely go check out the interview. Mike is an even more interesting interview than I am. So uh, 100% uh, recommend. Maybe, maybe you'll even be kind enough to link that up in the show notes. Uh, I will do that. Good idea. I'll do that. If All right. not, I'll just spam comments and leave it in there. <laughs> That'll work too. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Mike. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.